Hi everybody, how you doing? Welcome to the latest episode of From the Rock to the Cloud. Um, and as you know, we talk about everything to do with Windows Server, a little bit of Azure, all that kind of exciting stuff. And as always, we've got a guest to help the incompetent host uh, through understanding this technology. So today we've got a very special guest. Uh, we've got the Bartman. Uh, which is why I've got Bart up in my uh, up in my pixel box behind me. But uh, we've got Anthony uh, Bartello um, all the way from well, you're you're from you're from the Rock, so this is like perfect. We, you're from the, like we couldn't have a better expert to talk about server and Rock, and um, we're going to talk about I think Azure backup recovery today, aren't we? So you're you're the right man for this. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Anthony. <laughs> So yeah, Maltese uh, background. I live in Canada, uh, in Toronto. Uh, it's uh, warm here right now. <laughs> you see, you have snow. A lot of people say, "Do you live in an igloo?" Nope, it's uh, it's hot here right now. <laughs> we do use Celsius, so it's about thirty degrees right now. Um, and I'm excited to talk about Azure Backup, especially because of the need for it in hybrid. Right? You know, we we hear the stories. Hey, I was back in the day of solid on-premises uh, implementation of architecture, and I remember going through, putting the DLT tape into the into my ProLiant 3000, uh, doing the backups on a nightly basis, doing the weekly backup, doing the monthly backup, the yearly backup, you name it for the fiscal year, uh, checking the tapes, yeah. having them locked in the safe, did the whole thing. When you know I was going further on in my career, the big thing that changed for me in terms of backup was the whole aspect of, are the tapes enough, right? Like, the example that I give is the, the organization I was supporting uh, was a law firm and the uh, from an outside was from a third party perspective, I was supporting law firm as a IT specialist and the IT administrator cool. was at this law firm uh, was diligent in terms of tape backup. DLT tapes changed every day, changed every uh, week, would take the tapes home and lock it into a safe. Uh, unfortunately, it was a magnetic safe. Um, but we'll oh. take the tapes home into a, and put them into a magnetic <laughs> safe and would lock the safe. And this, um, I mean, safe, this right? law firm was an, that, and that's the thing. You don't know what you don't know, right? It, it's completely oblivious. Like he got the safe at the local store and put it in his house and has it. The, oh, you know, yeah. all my tapes are off. Like he was very diligent about it and um, would go forward. He would even test the tapes prior to putting them in the, to make sure the backup was there. And then would put them in the Make backup, sure. but wouldn't do another test after the fact. And yeah. the tapes would go into the safe. And then this law firm was in a strip mall. Um, and beside it was a restaurant. And the restaurant caught fire. They had a bad grease fire and it took out the entire law firm. The whole strip mall was burned to the ground. Uh, but the IT Ooh. professional was like, hey, no problem. I have this all in backup. Tape after tape after tape. All the tapes were corrupted because of the magnetic safe. He lost everything. Uh, and it was Man. one of the biggest things in his life. Like it just, he was, that was his responsibility aside from the upkeep yeah. of the infrastructure and everything went down and everything was lost. That for me was an eye opener in terms of, you know, then you're looking at disaster recovery solutions. You're looking at scenarios where you're having offsite. Uh, the law firm was exploring into that whole aspect of, well, yeah. what, what if I was to have a separate data center offsite and the costs uh, for that. And, you know, for a small law firm, it didn't make financial sense to have that type of configuration. Yeah. And so that's where the discussion of Azure Backup came in at that time. And we're talking yeah. a long time ago, uh, for, and it was you know in its infancy and a lot of concerns around, you know my data has to be on premises for my ISO certification or my standards for my, my organization and my industry. I can't have data in the cloud. I can't have that, you know, sure. all my data being gone. But in respect to that, if the data is not active, it's just at rest, you know, there are special considerations that can be put into play for a disaster recovery solution. Uh, and Azure Backup sure. has a capability to provide that functionality. So, look, I think like, that's a great explanation of why. I mean, look, tapes, like, goodness knows, like, I had a great mixtape once upon a time. And, you know, and then, you know, <laughs> actually, strangely enough, yeah, like, I actually, I got it out and I listened to it and it was all crinkled. And like, it just, it, it didn't sound as good as I remember, right? So uh, <laughs> that kind of nicely moves us on to, um, you know, what is Azure Backup Recovery? What, like, what is it? Do you know what I mean? Because like, you've kind of given the real world example of like what people think or what was backup, you know, like I remember as a kid, 
um, you know, working in a store and I, the, the manager of the store doing exactly the same thing as the person from your story. They give me the, give me the tape and they'd be like, right, now you go around to the other office and they store it in their safe. I'm like, this again, makes no sense, but I have to do it every day. But like, sh surely there's got to be a better way of doing it. Are we, are we saying that Azure Backup Recovery is that way? Like what, like what is Azure Backup Recovery? So here's the thing, Azure Backup or Backup in general is part of your disaster mm. recovery plan. As an organization, you have to have a solid plan to understand when catastrophe strikes, what happens to your organization? How is your data pack backed up? How is your data retrievable after that? Yeah. The biggest thing that you have to remember is data is the new currency. And so that's worth, there's a huge amount of value in the data that you have, and you have to treat it as such. So in respect to your data, having it backed up on a tape, is that enough? And having it at a separate location, what have you? Further to that, in terms of disaster recovery, it's not enough just to test the, It's not enough just to have a backup. You also have to test it. You also have to ensure that the functionality that backup has in terms of your data is usable. Sure. It's not just enough to put it somewhere and, and, and forget it. The other aspect to that is from a development perspective. We're seeing a lot of situations where, hey, developers are coming in to build a solution. You don't want to have these developers building a solution directly on your live data. So you want to build a, no. dev, a dev environment. Doing that from a tape, it could take hours, if not days, to set up the whole environment as it's just spinning up an in, a dev instance based on your backup. You know, there's so many okay. different reasons why. The biggest thing to remember, though, when you're looking at this is what is required of your organization. I can tell you to, you know, till, till I'm blue in the face how awesome Azure Backup is, but it also has to meet your requirements and your needs for your organization. It has yeah. to be something where it fits. We talked a little bit of this before, before the, the show. You know, it's awesome to have this ability to push it out to the cloud, but a lot of organizations still have an on-premises implementation of architecture because of need, because of cost, whatever the functionality yeah. requirement is. Azure Backup is that capability of having offsite if it you know meets your your requirements not needing yeah. these tapes not needing the DL, dlt back configuration automating the whole solution even the testing can be automated which is huge and then okay. as required pulling it you know you're looking at if you're, you have a, your office is completely down you can do that swap over to your backup that's in cloud and have everybody put up and running within hours you have that scenario where you're moving sites uh, and you're moving to another site and pushing off your data to the other site, your backup to the other site, and, and then deploying your image that way. There, there's so many different uses just above and beyond the simple backup implementation. And it's not just okay. Windows. It's also other, mm. other functionality and other services out there as well. So, yeah, I kind of, like, you touched on something there, but, like, you know, the majority of people out there have got an on-prem. So let, let's just put ourselves in an on-prem scenario. Right. How how do we use Azure Backup? Like, how can I get Azure Backup? And I've got on prem. So, say I've got, uh, you know, Windows Server twenty nineteen on prem infrastructure as it is at the moment. How how do I go about enabling that Azure Backup recovery piece? Like like like, what have I got to do? Because I want to be secure, and I don't want to work on tapes anymore. So inside of the Azure portal, uh, you would actually add in your on premises servers to the Azure portal. A client is then pushed down to the server itself, and then your backup is scheduled accordingly. What I love about this, it's it's fully your control in terms of the backup, right? <laughs> sorry, 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 Annie, sorry. Ed. Yeah. Is that easy? It, like you just log onto a portal, you push a client down, you put it on your server, and then you've got it. And then you've got it. it uh, sorry, I'm just I'm just taking a moment because I thought it was going to be surely more complicated than that. No, that's it. Eat my shorts. So what happens is that. <laughs> when you've added your server, when you've added your server to the Azure portal into the Azure backup service, in essence, yeah. it provides an authentication key for the security aspect, right? And then okay. it pushes down the client to your machine, which acts as your actuator and capturing that data to be pushed out to the cloud. And then having the ability to select, you know, full backup, incremental backup, yeah. whatever is required by your organization, folder backup, you know, whatever that may be. If I don't need to back up your entire um, architecture that's on premises, sure. having the specific instances pushed out of the cloud, totally customizable to your needs. Okay. So, and I think I read somewhere that there's like, there's vaults or like, a, again, like, again, I'm probably just going to ask you things that you, you're like, oh, that's obvious stuff. Yeah. 
but right there, like in, in 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 backup and recovery, there there there's vaults, right? So first of all, what are vaults? Uh, why are they important? And then is there like a limitation on what you can do? You know, within within this, like, do you need like you know like a, a special subscription or like how does that stuff work? So your standard Azure subscription has the ability to to utilize Azure Backup. There's no additional uh, subscriptions that are required as long as you have Azure. The other aspect to that in terms of the vaults is your security uh, for your data. There are scenarios okay. where data is specific in terms of access and who can gain access to that. Um, if you're using RBAC or role-based access control, you have the ability to govern over who gains access to what data uh, in respect to your on-premises implementation or even cloud uh, for all your data. The same holds true for Azure Backup in regards to setting the authentication rules for specific individuals to access that data that's in backup. Because that, that backup data is just needs it's the same type of security as your on-premises uh, data for specific instances or specific uses. Because of this, you have the ability to set governing rules in terms of if you're going to go and access the backup data, what rights do you have? Do you have the ability to redeploy? Do you have the really the, the ability to redeploy in subscription, out of subscription, uh, into another subscription? Do you have the ability to push down to an on-premises implementation? Do you have the ability to fully access that data? Do you only have uh, read access to specific parts of that data? Do you have the ability okay. to spin up specific access to that data for dev environments? Like it, it can be very granular in terms of the capability more so than the functionality mm -hmm. that you would have in a backup on a DLT tape. Okay, so that kind of like grouping of the, the backup and resources is like a vault. Is that, did I just understand that right? I'm that's, just making that's sure. Much, you're, you're, right. Yes. Cool, uh, just making sure I'm on the right track because like, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm learning. This is not like, we haven't pre-talked about this and, and, and you're, I'm learning no. this live, so. And you know, that's, that's brilliant. Is there a limitation to the number of servers, machines? That can be registered into a vault, like where you keep all keep all your you know your uh, you know your, your your safe data and everything. Does it matter? So there's no limitation. Um, do know of of course there's an incurred cost in terms of the amount of data that you're backing up. So make sure you're aware um, in terms of what you're backing up into the cloud. There are actually cost analyzers that are available as well that can actually provide you some prediction uh, in terms of what your estimated cost will be in terms of uh, Azure backup. The larger charges okay. for the actual transfer of data, more so than the storage of data. Um, so when you're doing your initial backup, obviously you'll see a spike uh, in, respect, uh, in respect to your costs. But once that's been completed and you're doing inc incremental backups, the cost is substantially less uh, in terms of that implementation. The biggest thing out of this, though, is that on a dime, I can turn on that infrastructure that's in the cloud and it would be seamless to your okay. end users should disaster strike. Uh, and you, your your organization would continue to function uh, without the need of you know restoring to another infrastructure. It, it can be a temporary scenario. It doesn't have to be a you know 100%. That's it for going forward. You can go back to on premises okay. if required. Uh, but there's that peace of mind that you have a availability, like having an offsite uh, architecture and infrastructure should disaster strike at your organization. And none of these vaults are metal uh, like uh, uh, magnetic in any way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that was a joke. none of the same <laughs> magnetic locks. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Just making sure, because right? like, what what's interesting about this is it's you know when you hear about solutions like Azure Backup, you immediately think, okay, we're talking Fortune five hundred companies, banks, and law firms, and and medical. You know, yeah. I've I've seen deployments of Azure Backup for florist shops because that's their bread and butter in respect to their customers and their, you know, daily activities and the transactions that are being captured. And so this, you know, a couple of floor shops uh, here in Toronto actually have deployed to uh, Azure Backup instead of having an on-premises implementation of tape because should disaster strike, data is up in the cloud, they, they're, they're safeguarded by it. It's, it's a minimum cost to them because it's literally, it's one server inside of their um, the floor shop, but it's something where yeah. It's a peace of mind that they know that their data is always going to be there. So it's 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 really the combination of like the right hardware, right infrastructure, and then that extra little layer on top of protection just to make sure that everybody's getting the right services. And I suppose what I've kind of picked up from you is it's about being smart, and I'm kind of you know it's about being smart with what you choose to make sure that you've got there. That you don't need to back up everything; you just need to back up the things that are critical, like your customer data or you know that kind of stuff. The stuff that's irreplaceable—that's the stuff you need to make sure is safe. 
Um, and then it can be cost effective. So, you know, that makes sense. It, how many data sources that, you know, that can you have? In, in in you know in in this backup environment in a vault say like is there is there a limitation to that or you know or is it just really how much you're willing to pay for how much data it like it's scalable right it's elastic yeah it's completely elastic right there is no limitation in terms of i can only have so many data points that are pushing up to the cloud it is you know something that you have to think about in cost and that's why it's so important to understand what your strategy is for disaster recovery when using azure backup do you require to back up everything or can you, can you just back up a couple things like customer information or transactional information? It's, it's something that you, you know, you can keep in mind. You can also supplement it with on-premises uh, backup as well. It doesn't mean that if you've gone Azure backup that you've now uh, eliminated the need for on-premises backup. You can definitely do both. Uh, if that's a requirement of your organization for ISO standards or certifications that you may have to adhere to, um, it's totally up sure. to you. The big thing though, with this is, the, the, the amount of time it then would take you should a disaster strike uh, to be up and running. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something where you're looking at, you know, a complete disaster and a complete disaster could be, you know, a, a, a tripped alarm inside of your organization and the uh, water sprinklers go off and takes out your full server room. And, I, you know, sometimes a server room is in the closet and unfortunately is susceptible to water leaks and what have you. That's a disaster and you've lost your data, right? Um, it, it's not, yeah. you know, it's, it's just something to be prepared for when you're looking at your entire solution and as your backup is a part of disaster recovery, it's not the full solution. Okay. Now that, that makes sense. And, and I just wanted to kind of go back to something you, you kind of talked about it earlier, but the, the policy piece, when I think about like, obviously the, my data's there, uh, I can set policies. Is there, again, is there a limitation to you know, how many policies I can create the, you know, the whole, like, it, it, again, how does, how does the policy bit work? Cause I, I'd imagine that's really important to the, the cause again, I'm kind of leaning towards the security question here, right? Which is again, it's in the cloud, it's there, but it, is it the, it's the policies that create the security layer or help build that security layer for the business? So policies is, you know, something a part of your organization in terms of who gains access to what, who can spin up what resources, who can, you know, set up, yeah. you know, a, a, a deployment of your backup. This is something that has to be planned amidst your entire Azure implementation and subscription. You would have it at the top layer in terms of your uh, access, who gets access to what, um, like the whole, the whole role-based access control of spinning up of resources, spinning up of compute cycles. That then trickles down to any resource that you've deployed. You can then get granular specifically on Azure Backup and say who gains access to what. There are different roles uh, in terms of backup, one to just do testing, one to do an actual deployment. Um, you'd have to go through all the roles itself. And then you can even customize your own roles uh, in terms of your implementation. And I know of a lot of IT shops that you know support organizations, what they'll actually do is they'll build these custom roles and export them as JSON templates and then import them into other subscriptions to give other customers a leg up in terms of having that implementation of that role already created. It's completely up to the organization deploying Azure Backup in terms of their security requirements, in, the, in terms of the customization or use of existing templates that, uh, that are there for them to take advantage of. Cool. So I kind of think of it, it's kind of almost like if you were actually in a physical world and you were allowing people to access to different parts of a building, it's kind of like that. That's how my, my kind of simplistic brain thinks about it, but that's kind of basically what the policies allow you to do, right? So yeah, no, that's cool. That makes sense. It's kind of, it's, it, this is sinking in now, uh, Anthony, it's sinking in. I'm, I'm starting to get it. I'm feeling good about a backup and recovery. So my organization, what we've decided to do, we've got like one vault, and how do we isolate different data from, you know, different, you know, different servers in the vault uh, when I'm restoring data? How, like, how, like, how do I get it back out? Do you know what I mean? In the right place when I've only got one, I've got one vault, but multiple things in there. Like, how do I, how do I know what, what the right thing is to go back? Well, first thing you would do is assign roles to, to the individuals to even gain access to the backup data, right? I don't know if you want to yeah. allow that for the entire organization. Usually that's held specifically within the IT department. Uh, in terms of that capability, okay. um, once you've set up that role, then you have that individual have the ability to, let's say if you're, you're going to um, restore the data that you put into Azure Backup, they would then be responsible for the restore functionality. After that, whatever policies are in place after the restore has been completed, that's succinct with your organization. So that doesn't change. Okay. Individuals have access to what data, that, that's in essence what happens. 
if you need to add additional roles to access your backup. So as an example, um, there's a developer amidst your organization, they wanna spin up a, a copy of the backup as a dev, um, a, a dev arm so that they can build out their applications on, you know, copy data, not live data, yeah. uh, to build out their solution and then punt it over to IT to have it deployed. You know, you can enable that type of functionality that when they restore that data, they can't restore it in the live production area. They would have to create that developer platform. Uh, you can even use yeah. the inclusion of Blueprint technology that allows that uh, IT to control what the developers do in terms of the de their deployment, but al allowing them to be self-sufficient in creation of that deployment of that area, and then push out that yeah. backup to that blueprinted dev area for them to have that functionality, but not affect the on-premises live data. Uh, so to you know ensure that nothing gets stopped in terms of production. Ah, right. Like it, it, it sounds ideal, and it sounds very, very simple. So you know, I'm just it's just great that we can tell people about it. Um, the whole thing, though, works on the Azure subscription piece, right? And is is there a whole thing between, say, if I've got data on one subscription and I want to move, you know, do I need to, you know, I've got another, you know, I'm dial up another subscription. Can I move that data around as as the the owner of those subscriptions? Is that is that a thing that I can do? So you can, but again, it's based on rights, right? So from a perspective right. of having the forest and multiple, multiple <laughs> I see I got the right. And we're, we're, right. It, we're still, we're still in that scenario of forests uh, and then the subscriptions replace the actual on-premises uh, implementations. But like your on-premises implementation, usually you have one service per application. The same would hold true in terms of subscriptions. You'd have a subscription for a specific application, which would be part of a forest that can have that connection across multiple uh, subscriptions and having the ability to actually yeah. push out that data to the subscription that's required. So long as you have access to that other subscription, right? And the rights are enabled for you to have the ability to push yeah. out that backup to the other subscription. Perfect. Um, well, like, um, Anthony, look, I really appreciate you spending the time to talk to me about this. Like, it, it is complicated, and but actually, you've made it very, very simple. And you know, for somebody like me, who's you not, know, you know, ultimately, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just a sales guy. So, you know, like, you're, if you're, you're making it so that I understand the reasons to do it and the reasons to use it, then, um, you know, your work here is done. Uh, but no, it's not done. Uh, actually, we're going to move on to the fun part of uh, of our of, of our call. Um, the again the producers as ever love to make me look stupid um it's uh, you know it's it's one of their favorite things so we have this little part of the show where basically we uh, we show some memes uh, to me and to you and then uh, we're going to get the reaction now obviously from an audience perspective if you're loving these memes and um, you've seen a few of the shows and you've got a meme that you want us to show to to an expert make sure you put it in the comments and make sure you you send it through to us um like we'd love we'd love to have your impact we'd love to have your feedback so we you know we definitely want to get those comments and all that stuff coming anyway but if i'm lucky with the power of a producer uh, if i say three two one show us a meme three two one show us a meme we get a meme right okay so we've got so server says <laughs> if you don't know what's wrong i'm not gonna i'm not gonna tell you <laughs> i mean i I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what's wrong with this meme. Does this does this mean anything to you, Anthony? So it, it does. It tells me that you have your Windows Admin Center is not set up properly, or you haven't incorporated Azure monitoring to understand what's going on in your in-premises environment. Usually, uh, that's not the case anymore. But yeah, I, I get the meme. <laughs> <laughs> But no, no. So, like I said, uh, they are, they are certainly there to make me look silly, right? Okay, so we're going to do another one really quick. Meme number two. Here we go. <laughs> Boss, the server is down. <laughs> well, just restart it. Mm, it's not that simple. Um, well, like this. Now, if there's ever a reason for you know for backup and recovery, like this is the meme for it, right? Oh, there you go. This reminds me of a story, um, a, a new organization, a new, a new retail uh, um, organization was setting up shop uh, and they had these servers in the back room and somebody decided to use them as a, uh, a table to cut wood uh, <laughs> on top of the Ooh. servers because it was a level, oh. <laughs> right? Now the blade didn't hit the <laughs> server, but that individual that was doing the construction was let go immediately. Uh, that reminds me of that. <laughs> Uh, it is amazing though that the that, that sort of the dis 
the disregard that the old server has in the corner of like you know someone's store or like you know someone's office or whatever like it's just like oh yeah that, you know that just keeps on working and you know i the, think the you know, i think we can safely say amount... sorry sorry yeah you go Oh, I was just going to say the amount of servers that I've seen that have house plants on top of them uh, with water stains rolling down the side of the server. I, you know, oh. I've seen it so many times. Uh, people just don't know, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and that water cooling technology is is not going to, uh, you're not going to age your backup. Uh, do you know that? No. <laughs> um, well, uh, I think uh, let's just kill that meme because, uh, you know what I mean? We've seen enough, uh, we've seen enough uh, damaged and stressed servers. Um, I'm just going to recap really, really quickly about kind of what we learned about today. So what we've learned is, is that if you've got an on-premise Windows uh, server scenario, you can actually take advantage with, with, with the most up-to-date version of, of it. You can actually take advantage of that Azure backup recovery. You can add that that layer on. Um, I've written down here that, um, and th these are kind of my two takeaway points, right? First of all, it's scalable to whatever size business you need, big or small. And it's also customizable. So you can control the policies of who accesses the data, where you put the data, where you move the data. All of that is completely controllable in that Azure environment. So, you know, I think, you know, is there anything else that, you know, you'd like to say to the audience, maybe, Anthony, before we go that, you know, again, I've super simplified it, but, you know, Azure Backup and Recovery, what's your, what's your parting thought? So, so actually, I wanted to add to your piece because you'd said Windows. It's not just Windows; it's Linux as well. Uh, so you have the full functionality yeah. of backing up your Linux, which in retail is huge, uh, especially on transactional uh, to capture that information. And then it can also get granular in terms of your data, uh, specifically around SQL. So if you have your SQL database, there's a specific client that you can actually deploy for SQL as well, and get granular to you know the data that's inside of that database for extraction of partial or full or what have you, right? The biggest thing to take away from all of this is sky's the limit in terms of your backup solution, but don't just deploy or implement a backup solution without understanding what are the needs of your organization that you support. Having a disaster recovery plan that your organization has to adhere to and everybody has to agree to. It's not something that IT can just walk in and deploy anymore. This is uh, in mm. partnership with the developers and the business decision makers of your organization and ensure that your solution is such that should disaster arise, and that's is something as simple as a house plant being watered too too frequently and, and taking out your server, uh, you have to have the ability to, to ensure that your business stays up and running or you may not have a job. Yeah, I, you know, ultimately the cost of, uh, of it going wrong is a lot more than the cost of protecting yourself. So you'd be very, very naive, exactly like you said, Anthony, not to take those precautions. So that everybody, like, thanks very much for tuning into this episode. As I said, we've had the Bartman, uh, that shoulder, even smart. Uh, we, we've had the Bart man with us today, uh, and Anthony Bartello. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your wisdom. Um, everybody, if you've got any thoughts or comments, or you want to find out a bit more, or you want to, you know, talk talk to, to Anthony, probably won't you talk to Anthony, but I mean, maybe we'll get a, maybe we'll see what we can do. Um, but obviously he's over in Toronto on Toronto time. So thank you so much, sir. Really, really, really appreciate it. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed this episode from the rock to the cloud, or in fact, sky's the limit, as Anthony said. And we look very much to seeing you on the next episode.